Hello YouTube, this is Trunnel. Let's jump on the kelp bandwagon and give dried kelp blocks as fuel for my furnaces ago. I recently did a video on a kelp farm that used flying machines. Now I know that a lot of you don't like flying machines as they can break if they are unloaded, which can be mitigated with a chunk loader, but even that won't protect you against the server restart. So let's showcase an alternative design that is utterly completely 100% unload proof. You can leave the area, restart the server a million times and this farm won't break. And even better, it's fairly resource friendly and very easy to build. It does require a lot of slime, but that can be generated using a small swamp slime farm. It's also very server friendly as it spreads out the inevitable lag from the kelp items over its runtime. The version I built produces a total of 33,000 kelp per hour or using the new experimental autocrafter, over 1,800 dried kelp blocks per hour. So this is from perhaps five or six hours AFK time. The lag is rather reasonable. The items account for just over one MSPT and we have a pretty constant flow of items. So it might go up to 1.4 perhaps and down to one, but that's the range. And then the only other thing that causes lags would be these open hoppers here that collect the kelp and the fuel for the smokers that are behind here. So overall, this farm is pretty lag friendly. It took me eight to 10 hours to build it in Vanilla Survival, but I guess I could do it in five to six hours if I had to do it again, because there are clearly some do's and don'ts. And I will share these lessons at the end of the video as a mini tutorial. Of course, you don't have to build such a large farm. If you just want a quarter of the rates, then just build a quarter of the size and you'll have a quarter of the building time. So this farm scales really well there's no complicated overhead or control mechanism. The design goes back to an El Mango idea that he used for sugar cane at the time. I will link the video in the description. Here's the principle. You can build a chain of slime pushers. If we power one of these pistons, then all the other units in the chain move in alternating directions, of course, and whatever was planted here on the side will break, be it bamboo, sugar cane, or kelp. Then we power the piston on the other side and all units move in the other direction. I've used this principle in the past for all kinds of farms, including sugarcane, bamboo, melons, and pumpkins. You can check the word download for examples. Now the big advantage is that it doesn't need a ton of resources. In a classical kelp farm, you need pistons to break the kelp. Now, depending on the design, you need a ton of observers. You need redstone for the activation. So one unit of this farm consists of 22 kelp plants, and it just needs 10 slime, one redstone block, and two sticky pistons. And the building blocks are, as we'll see later, scaffolding to place the kelp on. So there goes our next layer of kelp. And that means it's tileable, and one unit has a footprint of 11 by four, and a height of three blocks for 22 kelp plants. That's actually a bit more compact than most classical kelp farms. Now you can see at the outside, we need a bit of extra space because we lose the water sources. So basically we need to move this wall one, one to the outside, like so. But here in the middle, this one block space is sufficient that the piston will never interfere with each other. Now what could happen is that the farm gets unloaded in a state like this. And then we might try to activate this piston here. But then the other side just hits the push limit. So nothing happens, nothing breaks. The farm will not harvest at that moment. So that piston would still sit here. And the next time we activate this, nothing happens. Then we activate this pusher again. And once it deactivated, the farm is back in original state. So this farm really does not break. Why don't I use the usual design with pistons observers? Well, they need a ton of, surprise, pistons and observers. And with kelp, you need a certain size to get decent rates. At the end of the day, a single kelp plant produces less than half a dried kelp block per hour. So if I want, say, 500 blocks per hour, then we'll need over 1,000 kelp plants. That's 1,000 pistons and observers. This design here requires less effort per kelp plant. So how can we stack modules? And many thanks to MindFab, who reminded me in a recent video that scaffolding is the most versatile block in the game. And for this farm, scaffolding is really the only block that we can use. Because we can plant kelp on scaffolding, kelp will just drift through scaffolding upwards. So it lets items through from below. And of course, it's also waterlocked. So it can be used to regenerate the water sources that we need. And bonus points, if you have put in a few supports like so, 
you can place it faster than any other block in the game. So we will just use scaffolding platforms to plant the next layer of kelp and then build the next slime pushers on top of each other. So all we need are a few scaffolding supports in this empty space here that we don't use anyway. Now of course you can't have it between the pistons because that would break the scaffolding but otherwise you can plant as many scaffolding support as you want here and on the outside. It's fairly easy to extend the signal to the redstone pushers in a way that we have a signal every three blocks using this redstone torch tower. Yes, 2010 technology still has a place in this game. We can also make this a lot longer, but keep in mind that pistons have a certain activation time. As you see, they are not activated immediately, but take 0.2 seconds per piston, but break immediately. The consequence of that is that this duration has to have a certain pulse length. So if this pusher is too long and the signal is too short, then the system wouldn't return to normal state. What we use here is a pulse extender, which has a duration of roughly three seconds or one and a half seconds if we build it like that and keep the length to something like 70 blocks. This works out nicely. Now here we'll have the next layer of pistons on top of that. So we won't have a lot of uh, kelp growing here in the middle. So we'll just block the space so that no kelp gets stuck under the pistons and can't float up. Here I use pumpkins and of course I have a decent pumpkin farm. Now this is a complete layer of three blocks. So here on top we would once again use pumpkins so that nothing gets stuck under the slime pushers. And then we have the next layer going here. And here's one design where I piece this all together. So what's missing is a way to collect the items. And of course a way to activate the slime pushers at the time we want. What we do, we have a hopper line here that is normally locked. And we have comparators going into the lowest part of the redstone torch tower. And I have placed comparators in the middle so that you can see where the item is. So currently it is here. And this etho clock contains half a stack of items. So it's activated roughly once every 25 seconds. And here this goes into a pulse extender and we have an observer reading this redstone lamp. So we will get a short pulse at the activation and another short pulse at the deactivation. This short pulse is enough to turn off the redstone torch just long enough that one item can be transferred. So what happens? We start the ether clock. The item goes into the next slice and once the pulse extender runs out after three seconds, goes to the next slice here and stays there. And this cycle repeats every 25 seconds. So every 25 seconds we go two items further and the kelp will drift to the top of our tank. So what's missing is a way to collect the items that currently shoot out of the topmost scaffolding layer. And here are two possibilities. One is using a hopper minecart with a yeeter. So we have water streams moving the items to the hopper minecart. The items would actually shoot through the scaffolding under the hopper minecart, so that's not a problem. And what we could do is that on top of the slime pushers, we could start a new water stream because there won't be any items shooting out of this column here. So we could just place water sources here and have a minecart on the other side collecting the next 17 blocks or so. And then we would have a minecart yeeter collecting the items. But then we wanted to make the design unload proof. That means no minecarts. So the alternative is to set up water streams on top of the scaffolding and just have the items go into water streams on the side. Now this means we have a maximum width of 14 blocks here. So 14 blocks would be from here to here. And then we have the boundaries of our tank and then the water streams. And the farm I built is basically two of these modules put next to each other. Once again, we place the water sources in the middle where we don't have any items come up because if the items would come up right here, they would just hover here and get stuck. But in practice, they will shoot off here where they have a sideways momentum. And the price you pay, of course, is a bit larger width because here we need the water streams and the walls in the middle. So basically the minecart design would be, I think, four blocks smaller, but I think that's a small price to pay. I think I used six slime pushers behind each other so 66 blocks wide in the middle. And here in the back, I use sea lanterns at the end of the last slime pusher, where usually the redstone block would go, 
This is simply a debugging tool. Then I can just fly over and make sure that all of the pushers are moved in the way I expected. Now in single player this farm creates over 33,000 kelp blocks and in fact I need over 40 smokers all burning items to kelp. And here on the outside I use just an extremely simple setup so all of the items are first grouped to stack here at the earliest possible moment. Then they go into a common water stream and the water stream goes over all of the smokers loops back here because I actually expected more like 20 smokers, which I could have built on the front. And we have a very simple autocrafter setup, like so. We do use the experimental data pack that allows us to use the autocrafter in 120.4. The crafted kelp blocks will just go into the water stream here. Half of the items will be looped back. So dried kelp blocks go in here and then go into a water stream, which is here in between supplying the furnaces with fuel. We need that only for half of the furnaces and the other half outputs the item directly here and this goes to my storage. And at the end of the day I get over 1800 kelp blocks per hour, which is really nice. Now the kelp will be distributed very evenly. Actually this smoker will basically be turned off all the time and this one will run all the time. But if you're concerned about wasting fuel, you can just block off a number of smokers. Now if I would get kelp here it would just go to the output and at the end you can place a composter and have this go into a shulker box and if you get too much bone meal, say more than half a stack per hour, then you have enough kelp for another furnace. So the math is very roughly we need 24 kelp for one bone meal, so half a stack of bone meal translates into 800 extra kelp and that's just a bit more than one smoker can handle. So if you let this run for an hour and you get three stacks of bone meal, then you will need six more smokers. But don't be too concerned that you will waste fuel. Personally, I just leave them like this because I fly around, I work in my industrial district, so the amount of kelp is not really constant. And in the end, even such a furnace here at the end produced just a bit more kelp than it, than it requires because the items come in stacks. So if any kelp would arrive here at this last furnace, it would be a small stack of perhaps 10 items, which is already enough to provide a new kelp block. So don't worry too much about that. Now there's something to consider here. Let's turn on the hitboxes. Moving the slime pusher turns the block above the kelp into flowing water, which means the kelp items will not move upwards. So if one of the slime pushers is moved like so, all of the water blocks above will be turned into flowing water and the kelp will get stuck and not flow upwards. Now this sounds bad, but if one of these kelp blocks grows like so, the water turns back into water sources and all of the kelp will continue to travel upwards. Now naturally we would like that to happen before the kelp despawns. We have 11 plants here. And let's take a time, say four minutes, that we want the kelp to be at the top after four minutes at latest. The chance of these 11 plants not growing in four minutes is just 0.3%, given that we expect an average of 38 game ticks for these 11 plants in four minutes. And the kelp must fail to grow every time. Then of course part of the kelp is shot into the middle here and to the other side, so not all of the kelp is affected. Now, for example, if this slime pusher is moved over to this side first, then the water on this side will already have regenerated and all of the kelp will be shot over here to this side and rise up. Of course, the kelp from the lower layers must go through all upper layers, so these must have regenerated the water sources as well. And if we activate the slime pushers too often, then it could happen that at the time the water regenerates here, the slime pusher will actually have destroyed the water sources that were regenerated on top already. So this sounds like a bit of a classical optimization problem. Reducing the time for the slime pushers, and that means taking out items of the ether clock here, will cause more kelp to despawn, but we might actually harvest more kelp because some kelp might grow and get a second tick uh, where it cannot grow because it has no room on top. And on the other side, if we increase the interval by putting in more items into the clock, we have more time for the water to regenerate, but we will more often have a failed growth because of a random tick. 
And if you think your brain hurts, you can safely forget all that. I run tests and both amounts are just tiny, not enough to move the needle. To shoot a number, I'd say perhaps 1% of the kelp despawns or even less. But the takeaway is don't move the slime pushers all the time. Once every three minutes or so is just right. If you use them more often, you might actually reduce the rates. And here with six activation spots, that translates into half a stack of items in the ether clock or perhaps a couple of items more. Now is this farm that I just built better than a flying machine based design? I guess that depends on your perspective. If you don't like flying machines, the answer is certainly yes. But a flying machine allows you to plant kelp very densely. On the other hand, flying machines are not as good in distributing the lag. But the other thing is flying machine based kelp farms are super boring to me. I did it about two or three times already in survival worlds and it was fun doing something new. Now the other question is, are dried kelp box really the best fuel source? Running this farm for one hour gives me about 1800 kelp box. This allows me to smelt 36k items. This kelp farm works passively if the player is in the vicinity so that the kelp gets random ticked. So it will produce fuel even if I AFK in another farm nearby or build something. And I certainly had a blast designing and building the farm. It's always fun to play with new technologies. But my one dimensional wither skeleton farm, which was actually faster to build, gives over a shulker of coal blocks per hour, which can smelt over 140k items or 4.5 times the amount. If you are just looking for a source of fuel to power your smelter as fast as possible, then I suggest to build a wither skeleton farm that gives more fuel in the form of coal along with tons of bones and wither skulls. And if you really want, you could turn the bones into kelp and smelt even more items. As for the blocks, you can of course replace both the glass and the frog lights with any building blocks. You can replace the terracotta and the pumpkins with any solid block that does not stick to slime. All pumpkins can also be replaced with leaves, but you can't use leaves instead of the terracotta because we need a redstone signal to pass through here. One thing that I will change is that I want to lock these hoppers if the farm is not running. These are the hoppers that pick up the kelp and also the hoppers that pick up the fuel in the back. I will add this to the world download. So if the farm is not running, it will be very lag friendly because all of the hoppers are either locked or we have containers on top. Now in the latest snapshot, Mojang did introduce a feature that hoppers won't pick up items if they have a full block on top. But this seems to be a bit in flow. So for now, I'll just go with composters. So the rest of the video will be a quick tutorial. I won't do a block by block tutorial here, but I'll give you some cliff notes on how to build this farm. Start with the redstone controlling the slime pushers. This will allow you to build up a small portion of the farm later and have it running to produce the kelp for the rest of the farm. Then you build up the dirt floor and the walls. Of course the floor could be any material where you can plant kelp. You don't have to build both tanks at the same time. You can just build one tank, make it operational, and while it produces, you can build a second tank. But we most definitely want to fill the whole tank with water at one time, because it would be much more effort to fill the tank layer by layer with water. At this point, it will really help if you have a conduit to get permanent water breathing. It's really a game changer. So let's say you have built a tank and you want to get the water in. Now let's start with the best method to fill this tank with water. And all you need to do is to place ice on every second block here at the top where you want the water. Doesn't really matter if you place a bit too much ice. And now there are two ways. Now if you just use a pickaxe, you won't get water because there's no solid block underneath. But you could, for example, use a second ice block below, break the top ice with a pickaxe that doesn't have silk touch, and then just get rid of the lower block. Alternatively, and this is what I usually do, just place a torch on each ice block and after a minute or so, all of these ice will have melted. There we go. If there's some ice left, you can always use the pickaxe method. And now you place a single kelp plant under each ice. So these are the spots where we have the ice on top. Because you can plant kelp in falling water. And now if you bone meal a kelp plant, and you can do this using fast right click. So this is really fast. All of these blocks will have turned from flowing water to water sources. And if we do this with the next plant, then the blocks between the plants regenerate to water sources. After doing one side, 
we have a solid wall of water sources. And the effect is actually better if we do this from the other side, although it's not necessary. And as soon as you do the last plant, the magic happens because all of the water regenerates to sources. So you can fill such a tank in five minutes perhaps. And now you just break the kelp plants. This will also give you just a bit of kelp to plant for the farm. Now if you place scaffolding in the water, it will become immediately waterlogged. So what you can do is just place the scaffolding supports on the side and then put in the scaffolding platforms for the farm. Now in theory, you could put in the scaffolding first, which would actually be a bit faster because swim mechanics in Minecraft are always wonky. And in theory, scaffolding can be waterlogged, so scaffolding shouldn't interfere. So if you have a support here, you would have to place the ice on both sides. But unfortunately, in practice, it doesn't work this way. In practice, it seems that the water spreading doesn't work nearly as good as expected. So parts of the tank would generate nicely, but then the generation stopped and I had to plant more kelp to generate more water sources in between. And in the end, I suppose it would have been faster to first put in the water and then place the scaffolding. What I'm showing here was actually the better of the two tanks. The other one was even worse. And I guess if you have a conduit to take care of the water breathing, then you can probably get used to the wonky water mechanics and place the scaffolding in the filled tank. Then you put in the slime and the redstone, alternating 10 blocks of slime, one block of redstone. And on the way back, you place two layers of pumpkins. And the next step is to put in the pistons on both sides, one block behind the redstone blocks but not yet the pumpkins between the pistons. You want to place the pistons before the kelp, because otherwise the kelp will grow into the spots where you have to place the pistons and you have to break kelp all the time. And once the pistons are in, you place the kelp. You can actually go to swim mode and hold down crouch. And if you do it just right, you can swim pretty fast and put in a complete row of kelp in one go. And now the order is pretty arbitrary. Put in the pumpkins between the pistons by breaking the scaffolding here and close the roof. Also put in the water streams on top of the roof by just using an ice layer and breaking it. So once the first module was operational, I put in the water streams on the side and just rigged a couple of hoppers with shulker boxes to have the cup for the second module. And then I started with the smokers. I didn't really have a plan, which might have been a good idea, but then it's just a couple of water streams moving the kelp to the smokers, hoppers from the smokers to the auto crafter, and then a water stream to bring back the dried kelp to the fuel hoppers. You need to put in a bit of coal to jump start the smelting, of course. Two stacks of coal per furnace will be fine. And you can block off four slots on the fuel hopper using dummy items, so only one stack of dried kelp blocks will be caught in the hopper. Then it will take a while until the production really starts. I was at my copper farm for a while, so pretty much the furnaces were running, but the kelp area didn't get random ticked. So all of these furnaces are now empty, but all of them have two stacks of dried kelp blocks in there. So there's no problem at all. We just have to wait a couple of minutes and then most of the furnaces will be running again. Thanks for watching. Leave a like if you want to see more content like this. Please subscribe so that you don't miss any of my videos and see you next time. Bye bye.